My name is Daniel Clayman. I'm honored to be here talking to you guys. It's been two years since I spoke at this event last time. I guess I didn't completely suck last time if you invited me back, so, so that's great. So we'll, we'll talk about some topics near and dear to my heart today, topics that I hope you find interesting, and my hope is that at least a couple of people here walk away with some aha moments. I, I, I didn't know we had like half of you guys are in their circle, so, so people, people know me. I'm not gonna go into a long backstory. I had a corporate career prior to 2008, and I was miserable. I worked incredibly long hours, doing work I didn't particularly care for, work that I felt really contributed nothing of value to society. I was just insanely overworked and deeply, deeply unfulfilled. And then the crash of 2008 happened and I was laid off. I was kicked to the curb. My career was dead in its tracks uh, through circumstances completely outside of my control, which can be pretty infuriating. I was forced to completely start over. That's, that's not me in the picture, just wanna clarify that. That's, that's, a, that's a reenactment, okay? So I, I'm a glasses half full kind of guy, and I said, look, this is a great opportunity for me to, to reinvent my life, do something completely different, do a full reset. And I asked myself what I actually wanted out of my life and what I wanted out of my work, because those are important questions to ask. We sometimes tend to jump into things because they seem cool and exciting, but we don't really think them through. The answer for me came back, it wasn't, I want to be rich, I want lots of money, I want a big real estate portfolio. The answer came back twofold. I wanted meaning to my life and I wanted meaning to my work. I wanted to feel like what I'm doing means something. And I wanted freedom, the two things that are sorely lacking in my corporate life. And through, through a lot of hard work, through a lot of learning, through a lot of trial and error, a lot of failing, occasionally succeeding, through building an amazing network and surrounding myself with great people and putting myself constantly in the right rooms, which is what you all have done by putting yourself in this room, by being here. The real estate has eventually given me those things. Meanings because now I get to think up cool buildings like these in my head and with the help of some incredible professionals from all walks of life, from architects all the way to contractors and everybody in between, I get to, we get to bring these buildings to life places where people get to live, work, and play, places that people are happy to actually come home to every single day and call home, and buildings that positively impact the communities that we serve. And meaning, because through my software and education company, I, I now get to mentor lots of other people um, on how to create freedom through real estate. And some of you are in these pictures. Actually, Robert, you're, you're right there. So, and, and then freedom, because I get to spend my time every single day now exactly as I choose, which is something I wasn't able to do in my past corporate life. So whether it's working on projects I care deeply about and I'm excited about, and, and I still work very, very, very hard, or spending time with my family, whether here or, or taking uh, them on trips around the world, and if you um, fly internationally with three kids under five, come to me, I'll give you some advice. Um, number one is think twice. Um, but. But to me, having complete autonomy over my time is far more valuable than any amount of money or, or any amount of wealth. That's really, to me, the true definition of freedom and the true definition of wealth is having autonomy over my time. So when, when Jim asked me to come and talk to you guys about real estate development, I said it's pretty hard to teach anything meaningful about development in 45 minutes. But what I thought I'd do instead is go through some lessons that I've acquired and philosophies that I've adopted over the last 15 years of building my portfolio, and I've built that portfolio very slowly and, and methodically. So that's what we're gonna do today. I hope it's valuable for you, I hope it's interesting. Before that, I, I wanna show you my brand new Lamborghini. Does anybody wanna see my Lambo? <laughs> what? <laughs> I'm, I'm a fan of disclaimers, okay? So everything I'm going to share with you today is obviously personal opinions. It's how I've chosen to do things. There, there are people out there far wealthier, richer, more successful than me, and they've chosen to do things differently. There's a lot of ways to get to where you want to go. And just like you, at the end of the day, I'm still a student, lifelong student, constantly working on leveling up, getting better, learning new things, open to pivoting and changing my mind when presented with enough data. So on that note, let's, let's get going. Lesson number one, it's okay to get rich slow. Um, 
it's not just okay, I highly, highly encourage it. It's my favorite quote by Warren Buffett. You can't make a baby in one month by getting nine women pregnant. <laughs> but, but I see a lot of you out there trying. <laughs> You're, oh, you didn't know this was going to be a comedy special? Okay. Um, you're doing, and, and again, and, and this, is, this is a sophisticated room, right? So I know there's a lot of people here highly focused, but I see a lot of people out there trying to do too many things, too many businesses, too many income streams. You're doing real estate in too many markets, right? too many niches, too many side hustles. You're going wide instead of going deep, and when there is no baby after a month or two, you throw your hands up in the air, you say, this isn't working. You move on to something else. Maybe trying to make nine other women pregnant. <laughs> Good things take time, right? And when your knowledge and your reputation, your credibility and your skill set and your business is built on a shoddy foundation, you simply won't last. So true industry skills take time to develop, right? Real skills where you become an expert in your field. Cr credibility takes time to develop. The kind of credibility where people truly know you, trust you, and are eager to do business with you, are eager to invest money with you, are approaching you with opportunities. That takes time to develop. Same thing with real true relationships, which is again what you guys are doing by being here physically in the room and building real relationships. That takes time to develop. The kind of network that all of a sudden you wake up one day and opportunities just start arriving at your door. You no longer have to chase opportunities. That kind of network takes time to develop. And the more things that you're doing, the harder it is to build knowledge, credibility, and a network in any one of those things. So my advice, and again, this really applies to newer people and people getting started, but I know some experienced people that are also succumbing to the shiny object syndrome. Treat whatever you do like a craft. Focus, learn the ins and outs. And in order to focus, you've got to learn to ignore the shiny objects. And there is, it's harder than ever. Shiny objects are everywhere around us, and they're very, very, they're becoming harder and harder to ignore, especially if you're in social media. Right, so I, I've got a lot of flaws, just ask, ask my wife, but the one thing I've become really great at is being 100% okay missing out. 100% okay missing out. You know, you're, you're jumping into crypto because there's a trillion dollar opportunity to make money in crypto over the next 10 years? Phenomenal, I hope you become wildly wealthy beyond your wildest dreams, I'm gonna be so happy for you, I don't care. I just simply don't care. Robert, you're jumping into AI, artificial intelligence, because there's an <laughs> unbelievable opportunity to make money over the next 10 years in AI? Phenomenal, I hope you become a trillionaire, you know, buy me dinner one day, I don't care, right? I'm gonna choose to double down and triple down on where I've already built a foundation foundation of knowledge, network, credibility, experience. Because that's where my efforts are going to be better served. So learn to be completely okay missing out. And be patient for big results. They're going to come. This is a huge pet peeve of mine. I see people out there now take a real estate syndication course from some guru online. They've never done so much as a, as a, as a wholesale deal in their entire life. Now they're out there raising millions of dollars from friends and family to buy their first apartment building. I see this all the time. That's an insane way to me to treat other people's money. That's just an absolutely crazy way to treat other people's money. I wanted to be a real estate developer since before I got into real estate. I spent the first six years doing nothing but single family houses on my dime. I learned on my dime. I did single family renovations, occasional duplex, and I learned the business. I learned finding deals, negotiating with banks, lining up financing, estimating repairs, dealing with contractors, leasing property management. And then I finally did my first development project. This is the very first duplex I ever built. And I took what I learned from that duplex and I applied and I built a four unit, then a six unit, then a 14 unit, then a 25 unit, which is broke down on an almost 50 unit project. And now we have 100 and 200 unit projects in the pipeline on land that I already own. But when I kick off these deals, hopefully next year, I'm gonna go into them with a foundation of experience, of confidence, and if I do choose to raise outside capital, which I'm not sure that I will, 
I'm not going to feel like a complete scumbag gambling with other people's money, right? Getting rich slow is okay. And the last point I'll leave you with is your ability to handle money also depends on you coming into that money slowly. We all know people that got wealthy quickly. They're almost always blow it, probably like this douche, you know? <laughs> Same applies to businesses. If you take a brand new business and you scale it too quickly, all the important things like customer support, processes, procedures usually fall to the wayside. So get rich slow. All right, number two, and there's going to be a common theme to these. Buy or build and then hold forever. And when I talk a lot, I get really parched. So we all know that wealth in any business is achieved over time, but especially so in real estate, right? Generational wealth in real estate is built over time, the kind of generational wealth that you should be pretty nervous to pass down to your children, all right, that kind of wealth. All the positive benefits of holding real estate, appreciation, depreciation, amortization, they compound incredibly over time, but compounding needs time to take effect. Take a look at these numbers. I don't know if people in the back can see this. Um, this is a million dollar mortgage at 6% interest and 25 year amortization. In the first five years, your tenants pay off 10% of your note balance. So $100,000 gets added to your net worth, and that's nice, right? That's good. Same exact property, in the third five years, that number almost doubles. That's just amortization. Same property, same five-year period, roughly same amount of effort to own and manage it, maybe a little more because by then some deferred maintenance starts to creep up. But just the amortization alone in the third five years doubles. We haven't even touched appreciation, cash flow. Why, why would you sell it, right? Th the entire beauty of real estate to me, which is why I don't understand people that exclusively choose to focus on wholesaling or flipping transactional income, the entire beauty of real estate to me is you do the work once and you get paid forever. You do the work one time to acquire, and we're not talking apartment buildings, houses, whatever. You do the work one time to acquire an asset, it's going to pay you for the rest of your life. It's like the laziest business in the world. It's amazing, right, if you do it correctly. And, and this is important, right? When you adopt this mentality, you all of a sudden realize that you don't need to be out there chasing home runs all the time. Now, sure, if you can get deals for 20 cents on the dollar, phenomenal, you should do it. If you can get $60,000 wholesale checks, great, get them. Six-figure flips, wonderful. But you don't need them. You simply need to do good deals that return you six, eight, 10% annually, and just allow that compounding to make you insanely wealthy over time, right? Everybody heard this term, refi till you die? Right? Uh, otherwise known as buy, borrow, die? This, I, I guess this, 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 this probably is related to what, what Mary was talking about earlier, right? There's a lot of talk of dying. Um, this is how wealthy people live especially in real estate, they don't constantly trade in and out of assets. They hold assets long-term. They allow those assets to appreciate. As equity accumulates every five, seven, 10 years, they refi that money, a chunk of that equity tax-free. They use that cash to buy more assets or whatever rich people buy, Lambos, yachts, mansions, right? But then they continue owning the underlying asset and enjoying again, the benefits of, of holding that asset, more cash flow, more appreciation, and another five, seven, 10 years, they refi a chunk of that equity again, tax-free, and fund their life, or again, buy more assets. This is a mixed-use project that we broke ground on two months ago. And I, again, I, I apologize to people in the back if it's too small. When this building is built and stabilized, which means when this building is built and leased out, it's going to be worth $14 million. Look at what, now, our initial equity when this project is finished is going to be $6 million in this building between the cash invested and the sweat equity that we're creating. Look at what happens to this asset over 30 years using fairly conservative assumptions of 3% annual rent growth and 3% annual expense growth. Right, fairly conservative assumptions given what inflation has been doing. The value of this asset goes from 14 million to 35. 
and our equity goes from six million to almost $35 million. Assuming we don't refi it, which we will, why would I sell it after three years, right? It's ludicrous, unless I have, unless I've syndicated all the money and investors are pushing me to sell it because they're impatient. That's another topic. Now, of course, there are going to be exceptions. Is everybody here familiar with 80-20 rule, right? 80% of your management headaches, 80% of your problem tenants, 80% of your maintenance issues in your portfolio are gonna come from 20% of your properties. In our case, it ends up being more like 90-10 because it's a new construction, class A, really great assets. But every few years we perform this analysis and we call the bottom 10% of the portfolio. And as soon as we do that, my happiness as a property owner, my property management team's happiness goes up exponentially. And we've gotten to the point where we really don't know what to call anymore, which is nice, right? But this was instrumental for the last 10 years, doing this every three, three years to just increase my overall happiness, just by getting rid of the dogs, basically. There's gonna be situations where if you're not monitoring the maintenance and deferred maintenance in your properties or somebody else is not paying careful attention to them, you're gonna have so much deferred maintenance built up over time that it's not gonna make sense to own them anymore and you're gonna wanna sell them, right? And then if the long-term fundamentals in your market just go to shit, right? If, you're, if your city or your neighborhood just becomes a raging dumpster fire, right? May, maybe time to sell. Anybody here from Philly? Zombies, <laughs> I digress. But then again, if you look at Manhattan in 1970s, during the peak of the crime wave, when it was just crazy, the people that scooped up cheap real estate in Manhattan and had a long enough time horizon to hold those assets into the 90s, when Manhattan got cleaned up, made unbelievable money, unbelievable money. So maybe, I don't know, this may be time to buy. Which brings me to my next point, right? Time is the single most valuable, most important, most powerful force in all of investing, period. There is no substitute for time. First of all, time fixes many mistakes. I'll tell you guys a quick story. Back in 2006, 2007, I still had my corporate job. I knew I wanted to get into real estate. I just wasn't sure how I was gonna do it. So I was still living in New York, but I bought with a buddy of mine a bunch of duplexes here in Richmond in the fan, bought them passively. Now we bought them in 2006 and 2007 off of MLS, paid top dollar for them right before the market crashed, right? They came with a ton of deferred maintenance that we didn't have the money or the knowledge at that point to address. For the next 10 years of owning these properties, I didn't pocket a single penny. I didn't put a single penny of cash flow into my pockets. I worked for free for 10 years because every penny that we made off of cash flow went back into playing whack-a-mole with, with maintenance. So then we did our 80-20 analysis in 2016, the first opportunity I had to get rid of these properties, I sold them, right? In 2016, I sold them after having bought them at the peak of the market off of MLS, paid top dollar, we like outbid a bunch of other people, it was stupid. Right, deals I should have never done. In 2016, I sold them for a 30% premium over what I paid for them back in 2006, 2007. I made every mistake in the book, deals I should have never touched, and time still bailed me out. Time allows for compounding to make you wealthy. We've talked about this. So, so the point of this is if you're if you're newer, if you're younger, and if you're waiting to start accumulating assets till the right time in the market or the right time in your life, don't wait. None of us can time the market. If you think you can time the market, let's talk after my presentation. I'd like to hear your secrets. N none of us can time the market anymore, right? It's very hard. The best thing you can do is do great deals right now that pencil out today based on today's numbers with some room to the downside and then just allow time to do its thing. Because time, I, I paid graphic designers a lot of money to create this <laughs> incredible graph for you guys. Uh, this is AI at work. You're welcome. Over the long term, real estate does great. It always has. But in the, in the short term, things are going to get crazy, right? 
if your time horizon is long enough, it doesn't necessarily matter where in that market cycle you buy. Now, sure, it helps if you can time it perfectly and buy at the very bottom, but you don't need to. Again, you just do good deals and let time make you wealthy. All right, number four, who wants to learn about legal money laundering? That's it? Like three people? There's no FBI here. Relax. All right. So, and if you're in the inner circle, you probably heard me talk about this. This is how most people live. You've got an active income source. It can be a W-2 job, a consulting gig, wholesaling, fix and flipping, right? It's somewhere where you're either trading time for money or you're doing a deal and you get paid one time. You're wholesaling, you do a wholesale deal, you get paid one time, you better do another deal to get paid again, right? Transactional income. Most people spend that money. Now, if you're smart, you're wholesaling, you're reinvesting a chunk of that money back into marketing. If you're fix and flipping, you're using some of that money to buy more assets. But most of that money goes into other people's pockets immediately. You work really hard to earn that dollar, and it immediately goes to pay for your life. It goes into the economy, which then, let's face it, just ends up in this guy's pockets. <laughs> and then he takes all that money and he uses it to build a penis rocket. I mean, look how happy he is. <laughs> now, now, look, 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 ho hold on. I am all for space exploration. I think it's wonderful. But you worked really hard for that dollar, and that dollar worked for you one time, and it immediately left you. This is how everybody lives, right? And what if, inst and this is known as a rat race, what if instead you were able to take every dollar of that active slash transactional income and you first and by the way what I'm showing you here I didn't invent there's nothing revolutionary here there it's just this is common sense but yet almost nobody lives this way and it's insanely powerful every dollar that you earn transactionally first gets laundered through a recurring revenue asset again this is not brilliant there's nothing brilliant about this it's very basic but it's very very powerful right it can be rental real estate it can be, but it doesn't have to be. It can be dividend paying stocks. It can be annuities. It can be any number of assets. But now, that dollar works for you forever. And then you only use the recur, this has been, this is how I've been living for the past 10 years. And it's one of the reasons why I basically have no investors in my real estate deals, right? So when, when I'm here talking about a $60 million portfolio, it's easy to build $60 million portfolio if you're raising outside capital, right? And, and it's, you own like 3% of that portfolio. I own most of my portfolio because this is how I've been living. The only money that goes to pay for my life comes from recurring revenue. Money that I know will come back to me month after month after month, predictably, reliably, right? And so you can still fund the penis rocket. <laughs> I, I'm guessing at Jim's boot camps, nobody's ever said penis rocket before. I'm going to set a record for how many times I say it today. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> it's probably going to wear out. But you, but you can still fund it, but you can feel good about it because it's coming from a replenishable income source, right? So if you have an active income source, like consulting, like a high-paying W-2 job, if you're really good at wholesaling, that's fantastic. But now if you can get really good at taking all of that active income and channeling it into recurring revenue assets, you're going to build your wealth quicker. You're going to make your money work for you forever. And you're also going to retain more control over your assets because now if you're really good at generating active income and then if you're really good at channeling that active income into recurring income, you're not going to need to raise as much or any outside equity to fund your recurring revenue assets. And it's very, very powerful. So an illustration for you, in my business, we have a part of my company that builds spec homes, right? We build homes and we sell them to owner occupants. Think of it as flipping, same thing. These generate decent chunks of cash fairly quickly in under 12 months. We take that cash, that becomes equity for my apartment buildings. And when my apartment buildings get built, and put into operation, we take depreciation off of the apartment buildings, 
and oftentimes we're able to accelerate that depreciation, take bonus depreciation when allowed. And all of that depreciation goes to wash the taxes on my flips because my flips get taxed at my active income bracket, right? Which then allows me to keep more money from my flips, which allows me to have more equity from my apartment buildings. It's a virtuous cycle. This is a very tax efficient strategy. And I'm not a CPA, you know, I love disclaimers, right? Talk, talk to a local tax professional. But this is for us a very tax efficient strategy and it's a very equity efficient strategy because the better I am at building spec homes, the less money I need to go to other people for to build my apartment buildings. Which means that when I build my apartment buildings, I actually own them instead of just bragging about how many apartment buildings I own and really owning 3% of them, which is what you see a lot of what you see on social media. Makes, does this make sense to everybody? Okay. All right, this one is simple, right? Cash flow is freedom. And again, there's a common theme to all of these. Cash flow is freedom. I will take a predictable 10K a month over random $20,000 checks any day. I'm just kidding, guys. Warren Buffett didn't say it. Um, cash flow is freedom. When you have a portfolio of long-term assets that pays you reliably, predictably, dependably, you have predictability of income. When you have predictability of income, you have now freedom from order. You don't have to worry about where next month's money is going to come from, money three months from now, right? And as soon as you have freedom from worry, you have freedom from making short-minded decisions. A lot of what we do in business, especially when we're starting out, is we can only look a month or two or three months out ahead, right? Because we need to pay our bills. We need to cover overhead. And as long as you're busy doing that, you can't think strategically. You can't think long-term. You can't make long-term strategic moves for yourself or for your family or for your business, right? Cash flow frees you up from that. Cash flow gives you freedom from doing shit you don't want to do, which is basically the definition of financial freedom. If you look in Webster's Dictionary, don't do it right now, that's what it's going to say. Financial freedom is just freedom from doing shit you don't want to do. It's your F you all. You get, you get, a, a lot of you have heard me talk about it, right? When you've got a portfolio of assets that pays for your life, month after month, and you know that money is going to come to you month after month, it pays for your life and more. It's like having a big wall, wall of bricks protecting you from all the bullshit life throws at you. Unexpected medical bills, here's, here's some money, right? Car breaks down, boss fires you from your job, after you. Look. <laughs> right? That, that's what it is. It, it's, it's beautiful. L little, little Johnny needs expensive braces, whatever. Here's, here's some money. Little Susie needs to go to rehab in Malibu. Okay, send her over. You know, little Tommy's college tuition gets hiked up by 30% so he can learn to be a non-binary Starbucks barista or whatever. Like, well, <laughs> great. Here, here's some money, right? But, but, he, but here's the thing. Yeah, I'm going to say a bunch of inappropriate shit. Uh, um, for, I think for most people in this room, I think when, when the general public thinks financial freedom and retirement, they picture sitting on the beach like this guy, which would bore me to tears, th tears after 10 minutes. I think for most people in the room, we all want to do bigger things, make bigger strategic moves, right? Work on more exciting projects, have a bigger impact, whether it's, I don't know, you want to start a foundation or you want to mentor other people. But you need freedom to make these long-term strategic moves. And for that, you need predictability of income and you need cash flow. So build, build your wall, okay? Number six, quality of product equals quality of life. Every landlord nightmare story that you've ever heard about or that you've ever experienced, I promise you, has been due to one or both of these two factors. Number one is the wrong product. Now, don't get me wrong. You can make good cash flow. You can make very good money in class D or class C product. If you want your mission in life to be 
to deliver affordable housing to the market or Section 8 housing. It's a very honorable mission, and I commend you for it. Just understand, if you're going to have Class C product, you're going to have Class C problems. Tell you guys a quick story. Back in like 2010, 2011, I had a Section 8 house in North Richmond in Highland Park. Directly across the street from me, a guy by the name, you might have heard of him, Jim Ingersoll, ha had a house, a Section 8 house, directly across the street from me. One day, we had a SWAT team raid my house. Not like a couple of cops stopping by a SWAT team raid, right? They, they arrested a bunch of people that didn't belong there. They seized a bunch of guns, um, every drug you've ever heard of, and some drugs you haven't heard of. Like they were just manufacturing and selling drugs out of there. And then a couple of months after that, a guy was walking down the street and got shot and crawled up on Jim's front porch and died. Tragic, absolutely awful situation, just like terrible. But shortly after that, Jim and I both sold our houses because no matter how profitable they were or could have been, it's just not the kind of issues we wanted to deal with and not what we wanted our life to look like. It's not all about cash flow and making money. So we sold those houses. And since then, I've largely pivoted to doing Class A ground up construction. We built really pretty, really nice quality rentals. And we give people really nice places to live. Well laid out, great finishes, lots of space, great amenities. And in exchange, we have great tenants that pay their rent on time, take great care of our properties, stick around for a long time, and don't, you know? Cla class A product, class A problems or lack thereof. And then the second reason why you or somebody you know has experienced a landlord nightmare story has been poor tenant underwriting. So if you walk away today with just one thing other than the penis rocket or building your FU wall, which I highly recommend, remember this. Proper tenant screening is the single most important function of a leasing agent slash property manager. There's nothing more important. By, by a factor of two to three, there is nothing more important than they do. Because who you put into your property will dictate everything else. Who you put into that property will dictate how the entire lease will go, how well your property will be maintained, the happiness that of your property management team. And, and make no mistake, and don't, don't misunderstand me, there are phenomenal Section 8 tenants out there that are financially responsible, they take pride of ownership in, in, your, in where they live and will take great care of your property. There are phenomenal low-income housing tenants out there that take pride of ownership and will take great care of your property. But you've got to screen properly to make sure that that's who you're putting into your buildings, right? So in our business, we were very thorough with tenant screening. We checked their credit, but it's not about the score, right? We look at the story that the credit report tells us. I may look at somebody that has a low credit score, but when we look at their actual credit report, we will see it's because of something that happened five or six years ago in their payment history for the last two or three years they're completely current. They've become financially responsible. Their, their credit score just hasn't caught up yet. Right? So we look at the story that the credit report tells us. We check, we verify their income, we check their criminal history, and we do something that I know for a fact almost nobody else does, and I'll tell you how I know it. On our rental applications, we require rental landlord history going back 10 years. Every landlord you've had for the last 10 years, we want their contact information. And my property management team reaches out to every single one of them. It's you, if they suck, it's useless talking to their current landlord, right? He wants to get rid of them. They'll be like, yeah, Robert's a great tenant, right? Oh, yeah, you should definitely rent to him. We call their past landlords. And I know that almost nobody does this, especially bigger property management companies, because think how many tenants I've had for the last 15 years. That, that have moved on and gone somewhere else and applied somewhere else, we never get these calls. Highly, highly valuable. And of course, again, you know, I love my disclaimers. Make sure that you're following the fair housing laws in your state and federal. They constantly change. 
my property management team does continuing ed all the time to make sure that we stay compliant. And, and one more sort of pro tip, right? We do something else in our property management business that I think has been hugely valuable. When we're done screening our tenants, we sign the lease, and on move-in day, we never have them show up in our office and pick up the keys. One of my property managers goes to the property, everybody that's on the lease is required to be there, and they do about a 30-minute walkthrough of that property. My property manager goes through a checklist. Yeah, here's, th here's the thermostats, water shut off valves, like every detail. Like we want you to have two shower curtains, plastic one inside the tub, pretty one outside, little things. But then what we do is we look them in the eyes and, and, and we set expectations. We say, we expect when you move out, which we don't want to be for a very long time, but when you do finally move out, we expect to get this property back in the same or better condition as when you moved in. We want to maintain this property really well for you. We're not in the business of making money off security deposits. We want to return you. We want nothing more than to give you back your full security deposit, but we want your help. We need your help to do that. Maintenance issues, no matter how small you may think they are or unimportant, we want to know about them right away. You're never bothering us. Reach out to us. Here's how you file a maintenance ticket. So think about what kind of expectations that sets with your future tenants, right? You're communicating to them that A, you're not slumlords. You care, you wanna give them a great place to live. You're communicating that you want them to stay for a long time. And you're communicating your expectations from day one before they ever take the keys from you of what's expected. And that's gone, a, I, I think, a very long way towards us having, like our turnover is easy. It's very rare for us to get into a property and do anything more than touch a painting and light cleaning. Very rare, even after they've been there for a long time. All right, number seven, we're getting close. Property management. So you guys hear me talk about building generational wealth, right? Great portfolio of assets. But it's not enough to just acquire those assets or build them and then just sit on them to make you wealthy. There's some steps in between I'm sorry to tell you, right? You have to be a careful and attentive steward of your portfolio. If you want that portfolio to actually appreciate, if you want that portfolio to cash flow, all of these things are incredibly important, right? Proper leasing, thorough maintenance, being proactive with deferred maintenance, preventative maintenance are incredibly important. If you take great care of your properties and if you take great care of your tenants, Everybody's going to win. You've got happy tenants. They treat your property well. They pay their rent on time. They stay for a long time. But the second you start taking your eyes off the ball, things could spiral down very quickly. Tenants become unhappy. Maintenance issues stack up. It's very easy, right, for your property to start degrading and for your margins to start being eroded with bad management. When you underwrite a deal, whatever cash flow you think you're going to make, 300 bucks a month per unit, 400 bucks a month, that can erode incredibly quickly with bad management. And the sad reality is that most third-party management companies out there suck. There are exceptions. I think there's one or two in the room. But nobody's going to care as much about your property as you will. Right? The sad reality is that most of them are not going to do a better job than you or somebody you hire internally. So for me, very early on, this was a game changer. I, when, I, when I started building my portfolio, I did everything myself until I got up to about 30 units. And there was a huge drag on my time. I, but, bless you, but I learned the business. I learned how to advertise properties for lease. I learned how to do showings for myself. I learned how to screen tenants. I learned how to sign leases. I learned how to do move-ins deal with maintenance, do turnover, and they formulated internal procedures. And over time, over a couple of years, I formulated what works, what doesn't, what I like, what I don't like. And when I got to about 30 units, I could almost afford to hire a full-time in-house person. And I hired that person, they came to work directly for me in my property management company, and their sole job was to take care of my portfolio. And as soon as I was able to do that, all of a sudden that freed me up from doing all the property management tasks and freed me up to do the more important things, which is building my portfolio and doing deals. So how am I getting to 30, 40 units? We're gonna do some math today, you ready? 
example, let's say you need, your, you need 80 grand a year to pay a full-time salary to somebody with some benefits and some overhead. Your property management company charges an 8% management fee on collected rents to your portfolio. So to generate $80,000 in management fees, you need a million dollar rent roll. Very simple, right? You need a million dollar rent roll. So if your average rent is 1,500 bucks, or rather if your average rent is, yeah, 1,500 bucks, that's a typo, right? Average rent is 1,500 bucks, you need 55 units in your portfolio until that portfolio can fully sustain a full-time employee. If your rents are higher, let's say 1,800 bucks a month, you need 46 units. So what I did in my business is before my portfolio was big enough to fully support a property manager, I hired one anyway because I was sick of doing the property management. And, but as soon as I hired them, it allowed me to scale my portfolio quicker to catch up. This has been the model that has worked really well for us. I, I have multiple employees in this management company now. And when you have a great management company, it becomes a tool, right? These are, these are real reviews, right? We, we only have five-star reviews. And this becomes a very powerful weapon for leasing because your tenants, before signing leases with you, they're going to go research you. They're going to look you up online. You'd better believe it. And they're going to see, oh, man, okay, I want to rent from these people. They care about their tenants. They upkeep their properties. Everybody loves them, right? It becomes a powerful weapon for hiring because, again, when we try to attract great quality people into our company, they will look us up online. They don't want to go work for slumlords, right? They don't want to be dealing with angry tenants all day long. It's a huge bummer. They're going to look us up and they're going to say, oh, man, I really – they build cool properties, and they take great care of, of those properties and their tenants. I want to go work for them. And the, on the development side, it becomes really powerful as well because if we're going through some contentious rezoning or we've got a development project where there's some neighbors up in arms over us going next door to them, we're able to go to them and say, look, here's our portfolio. We built a great quality product, but then we also manage it in-house. We're long-term owners. We're invested in the community, and we will take great care of this asset. We're the kind of neighbors that you want to have. Go check us out online. And so this becomes a very powerful weapon in, in a number of avenues, okay? Don't go to this link now, but save this link. If you're in our inner circle, you've already had access to this, but I'm making it available as a gift to all of you guys. We have an hour-plus-long training here on how we run our property management business with my head of property management along with a bunch of documents you can download and then a separate training on how we actually hire great full-time employees into our companies. You don't need to opt in, sign up for anything, pay for anything, just go to that link and that training is there. That's my, my gift to you guys today, okay? All right, last one. How to pick your partners. It's an important one. Step one. All right, I'm not saying don't ever partner with people, right? But I see people get into partnerships so willy-nilly. You just met somebody at like a local real estate meetup, now you're partners. Are you crazy? Like, a bad partnership is going to cost you far more money, time, and headaches to unwind than a good partnership will ever make you by a factor of 10, right? And so I've always been insanely careful in choosing partners. And, and I truly do think you should be as choosy as you are when picking out a spouse because, again, bad partners can sink you. And my advice to you is when you're evaluating who to partner with, your number one quality that you should be looking at is not how much money they have, how much experience they have, what kind of wealth they have, even what they can bring to the table. I think the number one quality you should be looking at is the strength of their character and their integrity. How will they act when things go south? Because things will go south. How will this person act? You know, if you partner with somebody that has a rotten foundation, just a bad core, as long as your interests are perfectly aligned, you'll be fine. You'll be doing okay. But the second that your interests start diverging, even just a little bit, 
that rotten foundation, that rotten core is going to show its face. And that person will screw you or they will try to screw you. So I think the number one quality you should be looking for is the strength of somebody's character and integrity above anything else. And I also like to say, just when it comes to real estate, one night stands over marriages. Meaning I'm much more likely to get into a partnership with somebody on a short-term deal that has a finite and finely defined exit and timeline than I am into a long-term arrangement where there is no clear exit. Because again, if you give somebody a long enough timeline, even if they're great now, something is gonna happen in their life over a long enough timeline that will mess up your partnership. So one night stands over marriages in real estate only. All right, that's all I got for you. This is how you can get a hold of us.